I'm John Buchanan, and as you can see, I've bought a new MIDI keyboard. I'm joking. This is my wonderful toy piano, and what we're going to do in this video is we're going to sample it. Now, this is going to give us an opportunity to see how it's possible to create basic sample instruments from scratch. And effectively, you can see that what I've done is to basically mic this instrument up. My microphone is here, and it's basically sort of running at 90 degrees to the sort of sound making part of this instrument. What I've done is to plug that uh, microphone cable into my audio interface. This is an SE4400A condenser microphone, so it requires 48 volts of phantom power. And effectively, what I've got a chance to do as well is to then use the gain dial to set the input level into my computer. Now, that's a lot of information at once. Let's just break that down. So when you're making recordings, the first thing you need to know is what type of microphone are you using? And if you're working with a condenser microphone, it requires power. And the way that that power is uh, supplied is via what's called phantom power, and every audio interface will allow you to turn phantom power on, usually for the channel through which you want to record. Now, make sure that you've turned off your speakers when that happens. Some audio interfaces will manage switching on phantom power by giving you a pop, which you don't really want to hear through the speakers. So it's a good idea to drop the monitor level before you switch that on. Effectively, what you've then got is a gain control, which is going to set the sensitivity of your recording channel, and it is going to control the level of the recordings that you make. Now, if you're brand new to recording, the easiest thing in the world to do is to assume that the volume fader for the channel into which you're going to record is going to set the level of the recording. Nope. That controls the volume of recorded signals. So signals that have been recorded, their volume can be controlled by the volume fader. The level at which you make recordings is controlled by the input stage, and that's got nothing to do with logic. That's all about your audio interface. So your gain dial or your input level is going to set the volume of the recordings that you're going to make. Now, what I want to do is to make a recording of every single key of my toy piano. Now, actually, there aren't very many of those. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 of them, I think. So effectively, what I'm going to do is to simply just play each note one at a time, making sure that I've got an accurate recording of each note. Now, you can see that my input channel is already live. It's listening to me talking at the moment because this microphone is obviously picking up my voice. So I'm not going to talk while we make the recording, otherwise my voice will be all over the recording. But also the other thing I have to be careful about is if my speakers are on, what I also don't want to do is to pick up the click track. You can see that if what I do now is to press record, And if the click track is running live, then of course it's going to be captured as part of the audio file as well, and I don't want that. So what I'm going to do when I press record next time is I'm going to turn the click track off. And yes, that means that my uh, individual notes are going to be recorded off click, but that's not a problem, as we'll see in just a little while. So I'm going to delete this audio file. This is my little test run. And obviously what I can then do instead is I can get ready to make a recording. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute the return channel. That basically means that the channel onto which I'm recording, I don't need to hear it playing live. Otherwise, the sound that I am going to be recording is then going to play out through the speakers. And I don't want that. I don't want to run the risk of any feedback. So I'm muting that channel. And we already know that when I press record, the next thing I'm going to do is to turn off the click. And then what we'll do is we'll record each individual note. And between those, I'm going to be quiet. And Will's going to be quiet too. Okay, here we go.
was exciting, wasn't it? Okay, now a couple of things happened during the recording of that, which were interesting. So this note triggered twice, and so did the last one. And I've kept them because it would be interesting to see how that translates into the sampler. But of course, one thing I can do if I'm making sampler instruments is to make sure that I play each note twice and that I get the cleanest possible sound I can if what I want is that accuracy. But sometimes it's really nice to have some character of a little bit of unpredictability in the instruments that you record as well. And we're going to just leave that. It'd be very easy to replace those recordings if I wanted to. Okay, so the recording stage is done. What I can therefore do is to undo the record arm light on this track. We can unmute it and we can have a look at the file that we've recorded. And you can see, obviously, that the level is good. It's a nice, healthy level without anything running the risk of overloading or being too, uh, having been recorded too loudly. And yes, there's a little bit of unpredictable in terms of the volume, but again, it's an unpredictable instrument, and that's fine. Now, what you can also see is that every audio file, every spike, every note that I've recorded has actually really got two stages to it. It's got the individual hit, the note that I played itself, and then there's me letting go of the key, the release, as we call it. Now, it's up to me to decide whether or not I want the releases to be part of this experience of each note, or whether or not I want to be able to um, just have the kind of clean start for each individual note. And what I did was to make sure that the volume had died all the way to silence before I let go of the key, so that I'm reserving the opportunity to do one thing or the other when it comes to the editing stage. So we'll see, I still haven't made up my mind about that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do next is to zoom into this waveform and I'm gonna start from the beginning and I'm gonna get my scissors out. And what I'm then going to do is to cut as close as I can to the start of this individual note. I want to make sure that what we've got a chance to do is to hear the individual note that we're uh, working with. But where exactly does it start? Okay, so let's really zoom in. And what we're gonna discover is that clearly that's the very beginning of the transient of the note, but that there is this little bit of mechanical sound before it starts, which I think I want as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chop right there. This is a very short section of audio before the note starts proper. If we zoom back to something sensible, it looks like I've chopped it right at the start of the note. So I don't think that's gonna seriously hold up the beginning of this note. It just means we get a little bit of the mechanism. Okay, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, it's time to make my mind up. I'm gonna decide not to use the releases. So I'm gonna click here too, and that is my first note. Now what I'm gonna do is to come back to the pointer tool for a moment, throw away these sections before it, and what I'm then gonna do is to label this bit of audio using the text tool, and this I'm going to call C, and I'm gonna say that that is C4. Now, this is the pitch of the note that I played, that's C, and I'm gonna say that I want that note to start at C4. That's the octave in which I'm gonna play my sounds when I have then gone through and converted them into samples. So the next job that I've got is to then go through each individual sound and again, apply the same sort of editing. So again, I'm gonna be zooming in and out to make sure that what I'm doing is starting each individual sample at a similar point in each individual one. I can throw away the release phase for the first note and this little bit of extraneous audio before it. I'm gonna make sure that I don't chop before uh, that uh, sound has had an opportunity to sort of die away altogether. I can then come back to the text tool and then what I can do is to label this one. And this one is going to be C sharp four. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and label these. You don't have to stick around for this bit. And what we'll do is we'll come back in a moment when I've got lots of individual slices of audio, all of which are going to be labeled after each note that I've played. I'll see you in a moment. So what I've done is I've made my individual recordings and now what we've done is to slice them all up, setting a start and an end point for each individual note that was recorded. And you can see that I've labeled every single one of these audio regions by the note name. Now, I use the word regions advisedly. What that basically means is we've got one long audio file, which was recorded in one go, and what I've done is to slice that up into individual regions, portions of an audio file. Now, what I want to do at this stage is to convert each of those audio regions into its own audio file. This is actually going to make the process of converting each of these notes into the sampler slightly more straightforward. There is a way to do that from the individual regions, but what I'm gonna do is to do it with audio files in this example. So what I'm gonna do is to select every single one of these notes, and I'm gonna click on uh, control at the same time as clicking on um, 
uh, one of the individual notes. And what I want to do is to convert to new audio file. Now I can see that that option's available to me right up here at the top. If you're not seeing it, come down to convert. And what we want to do is to convert to new audio files. And what we can then do is to specify what we want to do from a naming point of view. And I can see that what I want to do is to save each one in its own right as um, an audio file, and it's going to take the file names themselves, and it's going to create a saved version, a new audio file version of each individual one. So I don't need to worry about changing names here. When I press save, it will give me an opportunity to save those. And what it's doing is it's creating those new versions for me. So what I've now got is an audio file based on every single individual note. And now, rather than being a region of the same audio file, each one is its own audio file in its own right. Now there are a couple of ways in which I can convert this information into the sampler. And in many ways, the most straightforward way that I can do that is to go again, make sure that all of these notes are selected. And then what I'm going to do is to control and click again. And this time I want to convert each one to a new sampler track. Now again, I can see that that option's here. And again, if you're not seeing it, come down to convert. And here is the option to convert to a new sampler track. Now, when I click this option, what it's going to do is to say, OK, what am I taking my zones from? Well, what we're doing is we're taking them from these individual files. So in other words, the regions that we're seeing on screen are going to be converted into the individual sample slices available to us. We want them to go into sa the sampler. I could send them into Drum Machine Designer or into Alchemy, but we're going to go into the sampler. And then what I have a chance to do is to say, OK, well, what do I want the range of my instrument to be? Well, my first note is C4. So what I'm going to do is to specify C4 here as the note range. Now, if your first one was C3 or C2 or the instrument where you wanted to map this to was a different octave of your keyboard, no problem. You can simply just specify it. And then what I'm going to do is to make sure that the highest note is way above the, the last possible note I might want to sample. Now, what I mean by that is I've got 18 separate zones which I'm about to create within my sampler. And what I need to do is to make sure that I've got 18 notes at least here specified. If I've got 36, that's fine. But if I've got 12, it will only map the first 12 samples. So I need to make sure that the highest note is above and beyond the, the, the number of regions that I need to map. And having done that, what I can do is to press OK. Now, what will happen is that Logic will convert these uh, sounds into the sampler. And actually, what it's going to do is to create a region for me based on every note that it's mapped. I don't need that. I'm going to throw these individual regions away. What I want to do is to know that my sampler is playing in the first note should be on C4. That's C3. Here's C4. OK, so I can see in the input of um, my sampler that I've got this first sound playing. And then it should stop. Sure enough, because I don't have an F sharp, I didn't map that note. This is the range that I've got. OK, so there is my sampled toy piano. And there is the double kick on the D. It's really nice. And we've got a double kick on this F as well. OK, so that's one way in which I can map this instrument. Now then, there is another way that I can do that too. Let's just come back here for a moment and let's unmute these regions. Now, what I can actually do with the individual audio slices that I've got available is that I can ask Logic to map these directly for me. And that's simply to grab them and move them down here to a brand new track and then move them left into the track header. Now, I've got three options here, a chromatic map, an optimized map where the sampler is going to look to try and optimize various things about these individual recordings. I'm not interested in that for now. Or I can take them into Drum Machine Designer. I don't want to do that either. I want to create a chromatic map where every single note is going to be assigned to a chromatic note of the keyboard. 
It's exactly what I want. Now, by doing this, I don't get to specify. You can see that when I release on that, it's going to go through and resample every sound. I don't get to specify the start point for each individual slice. I can see now that it's mapped it, that each note has been put onto its own chromatic note of the keyboard, but the first one is at C1. What I'm going to do is to select them all, and I'm going to carefully move them up to C4. And when I drop them here, then what I have a chance to do is to have my samples mapped chromatically again, starting at C4. So again, there is each individual note mapped to the correct key. I've had to move them up to C4, but what we've now got is each individual note playing as its own zone. Now, of course, the moment these sounds are sampled, I can start having fun with them in terms of determining how I want them to play. So if I was just to select C4, the sound at C4, I can hear that at the moment, it's unbelievably spiky because it's a recorded version of the sound. And at the moment, I have to hold it down for its duration for the entire note to play. Now, it could be that I don't want that to be the case. I might decide to make this first sound what's called a one-shot sample, which means by switching on that button, when I now play this note, it will play all of it and it's still playing all of it because I created a really long audio file. So what I could do would be just to decide that I like one shot, but what I want to do is to adjust the length of this sample and potentially put a fade out on it as well so that it's a more controllable length. but now that feels like it's stopping a little early. So I've got an opportunity to go through and decide how long I want each note to be, whether or not I do want it to have, um, to play as a one-shot sample. I could even decide that I want this note to play backwards by hitting the reverse button. Or of course, what I can do is to come into the more synth-based parameters and shape this sound in various ways, perhaps using um, envelopes instead. So if what I wanted to do was to control the volume behavior of the sound using an amplifier envelope instead of those sampling editing parameters, those options are available to me. So this video has been about making recordings of an instrument and then mapping them in the most basic way possible to create a kind of chromatic map of the notes. And we've looked at two ways that we can do that. And as a result, what we've now got is a sort of classic instrument now available to us within Logic's sampler.